All right, tsunamis are tremendous waves that come in out of nowhere and kill many people. Okay, tsunami means harbor wave. And the reason is, is because they don't show up until they're in the harbor. This is a Japanese word. Before that, we used to use words like tidal wave, but they really have no, nothing to do with tides, so we don't call them tidal waves anymore. They are tsunamis. The reason they are generated is because you have an uplift or downdrop of the seafloor. So what you wind up with then is a step on the this, on this surface of the ocean. Well, if you've ever tried to make a step on the surface of any water, or any liquid for that matter, you can't make a step, okay? And the, it immediately tries to smooth itself out. And the smoothing out is the tsunami. So that's all it is, is a smoothing out of the sea floor, of the sea surface, because of this uplift that takes place on the ocean floor. That's a tsunami. Okay, now the tsunami, after we generate them by lifting up or dropping down the seafloor, and underwater landslides will also do the same thing. They'll make the sea dro up, you know, drop down or lift up. Oh, you can also get them out of volcanoes, some exploding volcanoes like Krakatoa probably produced the biggest tsunami ever. They estimated a, a height of 230 feet, huge wave. That is where, those are the places where you can generate tsunamis. Well, once they're generated in the deep ocean, to start off with, they have kind of two ways they move. So when they're in the deep ocean, these waves are actually quite small, okay? They are at most a meter high, three feet high. So they don't, you don't even see them at the deep open ocean. And that is why we, you don't even expect them to come. Okay, what happens is, is when they get close to shore, that's when things change. What will happen is, is waves basically start to bottom out. They feel the bottom of the ocean at one half of the distance between the two wave heights. In other words, one half of that wavelength, that's where they start to feel the, the bottom of the ocean. At that point, then they start to crowd together Okay, they slow down and they begin to grow higher and it crashes down. Now the first thing that you will notice if you're standing on shore for most, at least the bigger tsunamis, is that because there's so much water in one of these waves, being that it's 300 feet wide, that as it comes close to shore, it sucks all the water away from the shoreline. Okay, and as it sucks the water away from the shoreline, the people who are sitting on the beach or wherever they are do the worst thing possible. They say, wow, look neat. Look at all those fish flopping around on the, out where the water used to be. Let's go look. And so everybody runs out and looks to see all the fish flopping around and all the things they haven't seen before. And they've got about three to four minutes before that wave is gonna come back. And all of a sudden, this wave appears out of nowhere. Now, the reason the Japanese called it a harbor wave, tsunami, is because you're standing in the harbor and you don't see anything, and all of a sudden this wave comes out of the harbor, and there's no telling you that it's gonna come. It is still traveling at 50 miles an hour. It may, it's not going 600 anymore because it slowed down as it started to drag along the bottom. It's like getting hit by a truck going 50 miles an hour. Normally what happens is that if anyone's out there in the beach or in the water, the impact of the wave will either kill you or knock you unconscious. The wave comes completely onshore now, going at hurtling speeds, floods all the way in, and it can go in depending on the topography of the area. It can flood in as far as a quarter mile, a half mile inland. Now once the water piles up inland, it knocks everything over. It knocks things over, carries away cars, knocks over buildings, knocks over trees, anything in the way gets knocked over by this powerful wave. And then once it floods in, it'll hit its peak, the water stops rising, and all of a sudden all that water now that's on land starts to head back out into the open ocean, and it drags everything with it. Okay, and they found after that Indian Ocean wave, they found people out at sea for three days later, a mile or two miles out to sea because they'd been dragged out, okay? And lucky they, they were hanging on to something at that point, so they managed to survive. Now, we, at, so we can see some before and after pictures from the Indian Ocean tsunami in 2004 in recreational areas, in um, 
industrial areas and in agricultural areas, the before and the after pictures are just shocking, especially in the, in the areas where they were resort towns, like beaches, like we would see at the Jersey Shore. It just wiped out all the houses, tore away half the sand. There's basically nothing left. And that's how things go when a tsunami comes in. And the 2004 tsunami was a tremendous one. We had a couple of big tsunamis in the 60s, and they put an early warning system in the Pacific Ocean. The early warning system is basically there's a sensor plate under, that sits on the seafloor, and because the wave displaces so much water, it changes the pressure. And the sensor plate records these pressure changes from the waves going over. It is attached to a buoy. The buoy has a, is right above it, sitting on the water surface. It doesn't go anywhere when the wave goes by. It's only going to go up and down a couple of feet. But it has a uh, transmitter that goes to a satellite. The satellite then beams this transmission of your um, warning to all around the Pacific Rim. And so there are tsunami escape routes all over the place around the Pacific Ocean and horns that will go off as soon as the tsunami starts to come. And so they will evacuate people quickly as whenever a tsunami starts. And that is because so many people have been killed by tsunamis in the Pacific Ocean. Now, you can also have tsunamis in the Indian Ocean, as we saw in 2004, that killed so many people. And since then, they have put in a system Okay, so here is what we have as a tsunami tank. Okay, this is a tank filled with water. Okay, you can see. And what we have is a little ramp underneath this side that goes up, and here's our beach part. So we've got a beach up here. We've got a uh, seafloor down here, sloping away, flattening out in there. And what we have also is a little plunger. And what we're going to see is that we're going to generate waves by lifting the plunger straight up and down. So this has nothing to do with pushing things like you normally think how things splash. This is going to be by lifting up and down to create the wave. Okay, so let's take a look at how a wave would look when we generate it with the tsunami tank. Okay, so you can see the wave comes in. It travels along here, and this would be our deep water wave. And as it gets close to shore, it will grow up, and then it will go straight up onto the beach. Okay, the amount that a wave runs up onto the beach is called the run-up height. So you can measure a height here that's the run-up height for the wave. Okay, and that's one measure we can look at. Otherwise, we can look at all the basic uh, properties of waves as these things come in. Now, what's happening is when I generate the wave out here, we get a deep water wave that comes in at a certain point right about in here. It's going to all of a sudden start to feel bottom, and the wave will start to grow. So you'll see a smaller wave in here, and it all of a sudden will grow much larger in there. As the wave grows larger in here, it will pull the water away from the shoreline just before the wave comes in. Then the wave will splash in and go all the way up as the run-up height. So that's the steps that this wave goes through as it comes in. Now you will notice on this case there are a bunch of parallel lines on the face here. And those parallel lines all are measured in centimeters. So what we're going to do is we're going to try different parts of generating this tsunami. So first thing we're going to do is to kind of is run this with a stopwatch to see how fast the waves are going. Okay, we said that waves start at about 600 miles an hour. So what we do is you can have, you'll have a stopwatch. You press start when, the, when I generate the wave or when your teacher generates the wave. And when it reaches the far end of the tank, you press again. And that'll stop the stopwatch. And then we'll measure the length here. There is a, a scale on one side, and that tells you the length, the, you can divide the uh, length by time and get the speed. Okay, so you can take a look and you'll see. So here's what you would do. Then you would say, start, stop. Okay, and that's where you're, how fast you would measure your tsunami speed. Okay, and that tells you start to finish. So that's the first thing we can measure. We can get the velocity of our waves as they come across the tank. So you have to watch the height of the wave, the amplitude of the wave, as it comes along. And we can measure the amplitude by looking at the centimeter scale, 
for the waves as it comes along. And all of a sudden, you'll notice the amplitude will increase. The spot at which the amplitude increases is means that's where the wave is feeling the bottom. Okay, and so what we want to do is we want to measure that height and double it, and that can get our, our wavelength for the, for the wave. We'll notice that on this one, the wave is occurring right about here. That's where the height is going up. And so what you'll want to do is you will take a Sharpie when the wave is generated and figure about right about where that is, where it's, where it's happening. And you can do it on both sides of the tank. And we can try it a couple of times. And you'll see again where the wave about is happening. And what we can do then is we can measure in centimeters from the height of the water all the way down to here and see how many centimeters that is. And then we can double that. And so once we see that, we know that real waves are about 300 feet in their wavelength. In this one, we're going to find that basically one centimeter on this scale is going to be equal to about 12 to 15 feet, something in that neighborhood. But you're going to calculate that by, by av looking at this in here. So that means that anytime we see a height on here, then we can scale anything that we do for the rest of this is to find the scale, as I said, about 12 to 15 feet. You'll, you'll calculate it. And then you will then scale back everything relative to that. And the next thing we can do is as we pull the wave in, we can see about the pullback. And if you look, you would see that the water pulls back to about here. And we'll see that if I can generate another wave. OK, that one's not quite up to snuff. Let's try another one. OK, so notice the water is pulling back to about here when, as the wave comes in. So this is basically your pullback. And so if we figure out in centimeters how far it is from our leading water to where, how far the wave pulls back to, we can then scale that and say, how many feet away from the shore is my water going to pull as the wave comes in? Next thing we can measure is to look at the height of the wave. Well, once it comes to shore, maybe the height comes something in like this. And we put a dot. And so then we can say, all right, from our normal height of water to what the height is in here, how, that, how many centimeters is that? And what's our scaling factor? And then we can decide how big that tsunami is when it comes to shore. OK, the next thing we can look at is the run-up height. And that means how far up did that thing come before it topped out? So we put another dot there. We could be doing this on both sides. And that's our run-up height in here. And we then look at the difference between our regular sea level and how high that reached. And that gives us our run-up height. So you can do several measurements and calculations you'll see on your worksheet that go along with this. Now, as we said before, the tsunami is known as a harbor wave. And we've got it kind of coming in on a beach. So beaches and harbors are different stories. So what we can do is add a harbor. OK, and see what happens once the, once the waves enter the harbor. Okay. These waves are going to come in much bigger in the harbor. OK, and look at the height that those things came in all the way up to the top. So then we can remeasure all of what we just looked at. For example, the run-up height on the harbor is going to be much higher. The height of the wave coming in is going to be higher. Everything you will see will be much higher. Now, we should compare that to how high you are right now in your building. Would you get flooded if a tsunami came up the Passaic River? Maybe. Think about the height of your building. Now, last thing is we talked about people getting killed in tsunamis. OK, and so how do they get killed? Well, as we said, they get battered, and then they get swept out to sea. So let's take a look if we put a couple of soldiers on here. They just happen to be stationed in the wrong place at the wrong time. And we have a tsunami come in. Oh, see, so what happens to them? They get smashed against the back of the tank and dragged out into deep water, which is what we said. That's exactly what would happen if you generate, if they wind up in a tsunami. 
This is how a tsunami, and these are how all the factors that you can measure, and you'll be measuring on both sides, generating those tsunami waves, figuring out how big or small things are relative to you in real life. You'll see some of these waves are quite large and could imagine if they're coming in, it would be pretty scary. And anyway, that's how things we'll put together as far as a tsunami goes.